If we want to describe rotational motion quantum mechanically, the first thing we're going to need to do is to think about how we describe it classically. So if we have a particle that is rotating around, so it's moving in a circle, then its position vector can be um, determined by the origin out to any point on that circle where it's moving around. And the momentum vector is going to be tangential to that, to that um, motion. Remember that the momentum is the derivative of the position with time, and so a derivative is a tangent, and so the momentum vector is tangential. If I want the angular momentum vector, I have to take the position vector crossed into the um, momentum vector, and that'll give me the angular momentum. Um, and if I use the right-hand rule, when I do that cross product, I know that um, all of these vectors are perpendicular to each other. So they're all orthogonal to one another. So how do we do a cross product? A cross product is the determinant of a unit vector in x, a unit vector in y, and a unit vector in z. And then the r um, vector can be represented as x, y, and z. So some x, y, and z gives me coordinates, give me the r vector. And some p sub x, p sub y, and p sub z coordinates give me the momentum vector. And this cross product is equal to y p sub z minus z p sub y in the x direction minus x p sub z minus z p sub x in the y direction plus x p sub y minus y p sub x in the z direction. So I can write that my angular momentum in the x direction is equal to y p sub z minus z p sub y, and my angular momentum in the y direction is equal to z p sub x minus x p sub z, and my angular momentum in the z direction is equal to x p sub y minus y p sub x. The length of that vector, so the total, the vector itself, has a component in the x direction, a component in the y direction, and a component in the z direction. And the length of a vector is equal to the square root of the square of each of its components added together. So the length of that vector is equal to this. So the length squared is equal to lx squared plus ly squared plus lz squared. And the kinetic energy, angular kinetic energy, is expressed as the um, angular momentum squared divided by 2 times the moment of inertia. So remember that the kinetic energy for linear motion was equal to momentum squared divided by 2m. So here, we've made the substitution for angular momentum versus linear momentum and moment of inertia versus mass. So if I want to describe this system quantum mechanically, I need to change each of my um, observables, the, lin the angular momentum, total angular momentum, and angular momentum in each direction into um, operators. And so I do that by simply replacing the classical version with the operator version. So remember that Lx was equal to um, y times pz minus z times py. So to get the quantum mechanical operator for Lx, I would multiply by y and take minus i h bar, the derivative with respect to z, because the um, momentum operator is minus i h bar, take the first derivative. And then I would subtract what I get when I have z times minus i h bar, take the derivative with respect to y. And so we can see that Lx is going to be set, um, factor out of minus i h bar. 
y times the derivative with respect to z minus z times the derivative with respect to y. And ly is going to be equal to minus i h bar z times take the derivative with respect to x um, minus x take the derivative with respect to z. And then my um, z direction operator is going to be minus i h bar x take the derivative with respect to y minus y take the derivative with respect to x. So if I want my total angular momentum, then my total angular momentum vector or operator is going to be equal to, let's do the total angular momentum squared, is going to be equal to my Lx operator squared plus my Ly operator squared plus my Lz operator squared. So that gets me total angular momentum and the angular momentum in each direction. We won't go through all the algebra here, but we can show that in fact, L squared operator commutes with each of the components. And so that commutator relationship is equal to zero, which means that I can know with complete precision each of the components at the same time that I know the total angular momentum. So um, my, eigen, my eigenvectors or my eigenfunctions, my wave functions, right, are going to be eigenfunctions of both L hat squared and any one of, and one of the directions. But what I'll find out is that um, Li does not commute with Lj, so that does not equal zero. So in other words, Lx and Ly cannot be known simultaneously. Likewise, Ly and Lz cannot be known simultaneously, and Lx and Lz cannot be known simultaneously. So I have to pick one of these directions to know um, at the same time that I know the, the um, total angular momentum. I can't know all three of them at the same time that I know the total angular momentum, and I can't know um, any of the two directions together simultaneously. So um, typically what we do is we pick, and you'll see why, we pick Lz to be known um, simultaneously with L squared, and we look for eigenfunctions that are both eigenfunctions of Lz and L squared, so that we will know the total angular momentum, the total kinetic energy, and the component on the z direction, but we won't know anything about the component of that angular momentum on x or y. Remember that we can think about the angular momentum as a vector. And so the consequences of not knowing anything about the x and y direction component, whereas we do know about the z component, is um, that when we think about this angular momentum vector, so we have z, x, y, and we have this x, y plane here. Um, we can draw our angular momentum vector, and um, it has some shadow on the z axis, and it has some length, right? So the length of this vector is um, the length being lx squared plus ly squared plus lz squared, take the square root of that. That's the length of that vector. And this z component is lz. So we know these two things exactly. But what we don't know is what is the shadow that it makes on the x and y axis. So in other words, this the, um, the shadow on the x and y axis could be anything in this circle, right? 
that it could be here, it could be here, it could be here, it could be here, it could be here. So we can sort of think of this as a vector that has a set um, length on the z-axis and a set total length that is precessing around the z-axis so that we make a cone that has a shadow on the xy plane um, that is the circumference of this circle as that vector precesses around. And so um, basically what we're saying is that we know exactly where that vector is on the z-axis, but we have no idea where it lies on x and y. So it could be anywhere in this circle that projects down onto the xy plane.